let's continue now with interventions now the goal of course is to improve or at least restore cerebral perfusion take note that the interventions mentioned here is only for ischemic stroke now the surgical intervention uh, the only intervention for hemorrhagic stroke of course is surgery uh, that is discussed under craniotomy, which was uh, already under traumatic brain injury. So the patient with hemorrhagic stroke will undergo uh, open uh, brain surgery. So that will be a craniotomy by, in which they will evacuate, evacuate the uh, hematoma, that is um, the, the bleeding inside the brain. And of course, if there's still an active bleed, then they will... Uh, surgically stop the bleeding by uh, clipping an aneurysm for instance or um, repairing a uh, repairing the aneurysm or um, the ABM the removal of the uh, ABM these are all discussed under chapter 36 so they are not discussed in chapter 45 <laughs> The treatment for stroke, of course, is uh, fibrinolytic therapy. Now, under the uh, first aid, you know, when the patient is still in the uh, either at home or is uh, on on uh, in transit in the ambulance, the patient will be given uh, aspirin <coughs> uh, until they can make it to the hospital. Please take note of the complications that can result uh, as a result of uh, from stroke. Um, they are mainly hyperglycemia, UTI, and pneumonia. Now, under <clears throat> fibrinolytic therapy, so of course in ischemic stroke we have a thrombus or an embolus, then uh, we need to um, dissolve the clot. Uh, open up the artery and then restore uh, blood flow to the brain now the guideline is you, you can administer uh, nurses can administer intravenous fibrinolytic therapy which is out of place we will be uh, administering this within three hours from the stroke onset now the current recommendation by the American Stroke Association they extended that to four and a half hours uh, we can still give this IV unless uh, take note that there's a uh, exception here unless the patient is over 80 years of age has an INR uh, <clears throat> no I'm sorry is on anticoagulation by anticoagulation we mean um, patients taking the those NOACs at home, you know, newer oral anticoagulant <coughs> drugs, which are Prodexa, Eliquis, <coughs> uh, Xarelto, or um, your traditional warfarin, uh, regardless of the INR. If the patient has um, ischemic injury, more than one third of the brain tissue, uh, this is the most common um, artery that is blocked, by the way, the middle cerebral artery. And a uh, high NIH stroke scale, over 25, or if the patient had a previous stroke and has diabetes. In these instances here, they then um, the extension does not apply. Okay, so uh, three hours. Uh, the guideline again is three hours we can give IV out to place up to four and a half hours unless the patient has any of these profiles so if they have these then we keep it at three hours okay we cannot extend it to four and a half hours <clears throat> here is our guideline okay uh, take note that we do not um, drop the patient's blood pressure unless the patient's blood pressure reaches um, 180 systolic or 105 diastolic that is uh, written here okay uh, 
however there's another uh, statement here <coughs> that um, Since we will be monitoring the patient's blood pressure, uh, which is written here, we will be taking the patient's vital signs uh, frequently during the infusion of the drug. Um, we will give uh, antihypertensives, which are labetalol and nicardipine. These are the two uh, approved drugs to uh, drop the patient's blood pressure. Okay, so we need to drop it below 185 over 110. Okay. and then before we can give fibrinolytic, fibrinolytic therapy, meaning we can't give alteplase unless the blood pressure is below 185 over 110. <clears throat> All right, to continue. So in your simulation, your patient is Naomi Reed. She will be um, admitted for ischemic stroke. So the bulk of your uh, simulation uh, activities will be in this chapter. I mean, in this chart, sorry. Uh, chart 45-5 um, is what you will follow for that simulation. So you'll be administering out to place. Uh, I'll show you a video. But I will not recommend watching this video to the end because um, it's, uh, well, yeah, it's not really best practice. So we will show, uh, we will follow our textbook for uh, best practice. Activase Alteplase is indicated for the treatment of acute ischemic stroke, AIS. Exclude intracranial hemorrhage as the primary cause of stroke signs and symptoms prior to initiation of treatment. Initiate treatment as soon as possible, but within three hours after symptom onset. Do not administer Activase to treat acute ischemic stroke in the following situations in which the risk of bleeding is greater than the potential benefit. Current intracranial hemorrhage, ICH. Subarachnoid hemorrhage. Active internal bleeding. Recent within three months intracranial or intraspinal surgery or I'll just skip through this because, of course, we will not give um, a, a thrombolytic uh, for hemorrhagic stroke. This is only for ischemic stroke. Let's, let's go here now with dosing. Base, also known as Alteplase, or TPA, is the only FDA-approved drug for improving neurologic recovery and reducing the incidence of disability in adults with acute ischemic stroke. Activase comes in vials of 50 and 100 milligrams. The 100 milligram vial is most commonly used. This program examines the steps required to reconstitute, dose, and administer Activase from the 100 milligram vial. Aseptic techniques should be used at all times during the reconstitution process. This includes thorough hand washing and the use of gloves. To begin, assemble the Activase vial the vial of sterile water for injection, USP, and the transfer device included in the Activase package. Also, assemble alcohol swabs and two syringes, one for the bolus dose and one for the discarded quantity of Activase, and large bore needles. Reconstitute. Okay, so what's in the packet will be these three things here. So you'll have two glass vials in this box the, where supply in simulation will look exactly like this. So it will contain the powder uh, Activase, which is 100 milligrams, and then uh, the diluent is uh, another 100 ml of uh, sterile water, and it will come with this transfer device, which is a double-edged um, piercing pin, um, which will you, you will use to uh, reconstitute the powder. Now, the needle ha must be large, okay, a, a 20 or bigger. Do not use anything smaller because that will not work. It will not. You will not be able to draw the uh, solution afterwards. Now, why they have uh, two syringes here is because of the technique that they'll use. We are not going to uh, manually push the drug, which is um, listed in our um, chart right here. Because here, uh, do not manually push the drug. 
okay uh, I'll get to that uh, shortly so we will not use an, another syringe we will only use uh, one big syringe we do have 60 ml syringes in the uh, med cart and of course we have alcohol wipes and the large bore needles there to activate immediately before administration using only sterile water for injection USP without preservatives which is provided in the activase package this preparation will result in a colorless to pale yellow transparent solution containing activase at a concentration of one milligram per milliliter reconstitution should be carried out using the transfer device provided and adding the contents of the 100 milliliter vial of sterile water for injection to the 100 milligram vial of activase powder now um, as you can see on the bottle there's a clear plastic sticker here uh, this is a peel off sticker which you will use to hang the the vial later uh, otherwise you will be holding the the glass vial um, up for, for an entire hour for uh, what during the simulation okay so remember to peel off this uh, sticker uh, the, the peel off the sticker and that will be your hanger okay to to put the the glass vial um, on your IV pole milligram vial of activase powder begin by removing the protective caps from the top of the activase vial and the vial of sterile water for injection then swab the top of each vial with an alcohol wipe to reduce the risk of contamination remove the transfer device from its wrapper and remove the protective cap from one end see uh, be careful not to touch this this is this should remain sterile so uh, only remove or expose one piercing pin at a time so um, only one uh, cover should be removed at a time insert the piercing pin vertically into the center of the stopper of the vial of sterile water for injection keeping the vial upright remove the protective cap from the other end of the transfer device holding the vial of activase upside down position it so that the center of the stopper is directly over the exposed pin of the transfer device push the vial of activase down onto the transfer device making sure that the piercing pin is inserted through the center of the activase vial stopper invert the two vials so that the vial of activase is on the bottom right side up and the vial of sterile water for injection is on top allow the entire contents of the vial of sterile water for injection to flow down through the transfer device into the vial containing activase a process that requires approximately two minutes about half a milliliter of sterile water may remain in the upper vial remove the transfer device and the empty vial of sterile water from the activase vial safely discard both the transfer device and the empty diluent vial according to institutional procedures mix the solution with a gentle swirl or slow inversion do not shake slight foaming of the solution is normal let the solution stand undisturbed for several minutes to allow any large bubbles to dissipate activase will remain stable at room temperature for up to eight hours after reconstitution do not freeze solutions containing activase visually inspect the activase solution for particulate matter and discoloration before administration and remember no medication should be added to infusion solutions that contain activase any unused infusion solution should be discarded okay now I'll pause that for a minute <clears throat> the mo the rest of the video actually is not uh, really best practice plus there's a section there wherein they'll be using a uh, auto calculator for the dosing since we don't have that we will be manually uh, calculating our dose so the dose is 0 0.9 milligram per kilogram and the maximum dose is only 90 so if the patient's really over 200 pounds then of course if you calculate that um, that would be way over uh, 90 milligrams so if, if that's the case then they they shouldn't get more than 90 okay that's the maximum you can get so questions on the exam of course will be there will be a few uh, on uh, out of place administration as well as math questions will also be uh, about out of place so the instruction is to give 
your dose over 60 minutes, over an hour. However, 10% of that will have to be given as a bolus over a minute. And like I mentioned earlier, we do not manually push the drug. Now, warning you, if you watch the video, I just show you, uh, they will demonstrate pushing, manually pushing the drug, which is not best practice. So we will not do that part. Okay, I'll show you how to uh, do it. So there should be no reason why you can't uh, pass the um, simulation. Okay, so of course the patient will be in a either critical care or in a neuro uh, stroke unit. And during administration, we will of course be checking the patient's vital signs frequently and also performing neurologic checks. Okay, uh, and you are already expected to know the uh, beginning from the Glasgow Coma Scale to the cognitive, motor, and sensory assessments, as well as pupillary assessments. And here are warnings here again. If only if the patient's blood pressure is either 180 systolic, I mean greater than, no, greater than or equal to 180 or greater than or equal to 105 diastolic, either one. If either one is present, then you administer um, the, the either drug, so either labetalol or nimonidine <coughs> as ordered. And of course, we put the patient on a... Um, <coughs> on leading precautions because alteplase is a clot buster so any uh, clots that are formed let's say the patient had a venipuncture uh, prior and then uh, you gave alteplase of course it will dissolve that clot that that stopped the bleeding so there will be uh, bleeding so number one uh, complication of this drug is of course massive bleeding so you can save the patient from the stroke, but um, you may kill the patient from um, hemorrhage. And a warning here is discontinue the infusion if the patient develops these. So if you can see severe hypertension, bleeding, nausea, vomiting, these are of course uh, signs and symptoms of inter increased intracranial pressure, which would indicate uh, most possibly intracranial bleeding so uh, it, it should be stopped at that point and after the infusion of course we need to evaluate whether or not re, uh, perfusion was restored to the cerebral arteries then of course um, we will have a uh, we need a CAT scan to see um, whether or not um, our alteplase worked and of course, the antiplatelet and anticoagulant drugs will be uh, administered um, uh, usually around 24 hours after alteplase administration. Uh, we'll discuss those later. Okay, so let's uh, go back here. So our dose again is 0 0.9 milligrams per kilogram. We will administer that over 60 minutes and then... 10% uh, of that will be given over a minute. So let's do a example here. Okay, so let's say our patient is weighing 60 kilograms. So times 0 0.9 milligrams equals, I think that's 50 four milligrams if I'm not mistaken all right now remember that your vial after reconstitution has 100 milligrams in there 100 milligrams in 100 milliliter so that means your strength is one milligram per milliliter now for safety purposes since again you, this drug is dangerous this is a clot buster this can cause bleeding we don't want to give any uh, excess okay so we have to make sure that the what we administer and uh, you know we take into consideration that uh, we are humans we make mistakes so to avoid that we must leave only 54 milligrams in the vial that means we will have to remove what we don't need so since there's 100 milligrams there so we will remove how much six 
uh, we need to remove 46 ml so this is where you use the 60 milligram syringe I mean 60 milliliter syringe um, you use that to remove this from the vial okay so that will be kind of challenging so to make it easy make sure you displace of course you know put in the amount of uh, air equal to 46 ml and then so it will be easier to withdraw your 46 ml so after removing that that will be discarded leaving you with exactly 54 ml left in the vial correct so now we have 54 ml the instruction is to give 10 percent of that over one minute so the 5.4 milligrams or 5 uh, 54 milligrams or 54 ml uh, remaining in the vial uh, times 10 percent of course would be 5.4 ml correct okay and then that will leave us with so 54 minus 5.4 that will leave us with 48.6 ml so this is your 90 percent this is your 10 percent following me so far all right so let's go now to the auto place so like I said there is a plastic sticker a peel off sticker on the uh, vial so you will peel that off and then you'll hang the um, auto place on the IV pole okay so now um, say this is your altar place which is hanging okay so this altar place so we have exactly uh, 54 ml in here right so there is 54 ml in uh, remaining in our vial because we discarded the 46 okay we took it out so we we have 54 ml left so we have to prime the tubing prime the uh, primary tubing with out the place the reason is we don't want to prime it with saline because <clears throat> if we do then that will uh, confuse us plus we will have a problem uh, infusing the uh, the out of place with it within the correct uh, time okay so we will prime the tubing so let's imagine this is our piercing pin okay this is the drip chamber and in here there's a little round plastic on top of the uh, drip chamber so this is now your IV tubing going to your patient and you'll have a um, your roller clamp here okay, this is your clamp All right. <clears throat> Now, of course, um, I hate to have to review this, but this is a frequent mistake for um, students. You, you guys love to waste um, IV solutions. Uh, I know, I know, I noticed that you, you, you don't uh, clamp the fluid. I mean, the, the you don't close the clamp because you like to put the um, waste the solution in the trash can then that's what you always do like look for a trash can and then uh, drain the um the the air and the um some of the iv solutions there now in this instance we can't afford to do that because we have exactly 54 ml left in there so if we waste even one drop of this medication then we're not giving we're we will end up under dosing the patient so to prevent that is close the clamp please close the clamp first 
and then you spike the alter place okay now after you spike the alter place please open this vent okay it's a clear plastic uh, it's a clear round plastic um, part of uh, at, at this portion of the um, of the tubing uh, it's, it's right around the drip chamber you have to open it so just flip it open uh, the reason is this is a glass um, bottle it does not displace air as well as if it was a uh, compared to a polyvinyl bag which is what your IV fluids usually come in so since this is a glass bottle a glass vial it will not displace unless you open this vent now if you don't remember this then you'll have a problem because no matter how you squeeze and open the the clamp it will not run it will not prime unless you open the the vent okay so please open the vent again steps are one close the clamp open the vent then third is fill your drip chamber fill this fill drip chamber okay and then you can open the clamp number four you can open the clamp and carefully prime the air out okay so i can't get, make this more uh, specific enough for the uh, medication nurse all right so uh, if your med nurse forgets please uh, remind uh, the nurse okay so these are the um, <clears throat> what we do all right so you don't waste anything because otherwise if you don't fill the drip chamber then you'll have air bubbles all over your line and then you'll end up wasting your out of place okay now let's go now to the pump so now we put this thing on the pump Now on the pump, since we are giving this 10% over one minute, so how much is, so we don't have to follow the video um, because in, again in the video what they did was they uh, aspirated 5.4 ml or the 10% out of the vial and then pushed it manually since we can't do that then the easiest way to do is uh, initially on your pump you will put in your volume of 5.4 ml and then your rate will be of course you give 5.4 ml over one minute now i won't give you the rate uh, i'll have you because this is a test question okay so how many mls per hour will you run your 5.4 uh, ml Okay, how many mls per hour will that be of course that would be volume over time so volume will be uh, 5.4 over time will be uh, one hour but um, uh, and then times 60 okay so uh, there i gave you the answer so that will be your uh, your rate so you run that that will run it exactly one minute after that you will now run this 46 ml here over one hour so the next uh, volume of course will now be 48.6 that will be your next volume and then of course how many mls per hour will you um, uh, enter on the pump to run 48.6 ml over one hour uh, of course duh it'll be 48.6 as well so 48.6 volume 46 48.6 uh, ml per hour so that will be exactly one hour okay all right so that's for um all the place administration so uh, the rest of these you're on your own you um, admit i uh, mean monitor the vital signs uh, frequently and then watch the blood pressure uh, watch out for assess the patient for these signs of uh, increased ICP or signs of bleeding okay now let's say the patient misses the three to four and a half hour window 
the patient can still receive out the place not IV meaning the nurses can't administer it anymore the patient will have to go to the cath lab the patient will now uh, receive out the place intraarterially okay so this is now the doctor who will administer the uh, out the place because we can do that within six hours meaning if we, we if we miss the three to four and a half hour window then but they still within six hours then uh, we still have a chance <clears throat> so that means after six hours really um, doctors will now weigh the um, the uh, benefits versus risk of out of place administration because at that point if uh, we don't treat the patient within the six hours then we will now be unable to reverse the effects of the stroke now um, unlike in uh, MI where in uh, after a heart attack once we get the patient <clears throat> into the cath lab and uh, we get to the balloon uh, to open the uh, coronary artery then we restore blood flow to the uh, myocardium now the patient's EKG um, will go back to to baseline meaning we were able to stop the um, the tissue necrosis okay there, there was ischemia and uh, there will be ischemia in uh, acute coronary syndrome but um, at least we're able to restore blood flow now in stroke you won't see the um, the patient's uh, symptoms disappear right there so it will it, it will be uh, restored though but it will take uh, several weeks to several months to uh, of rehab in order to restore function um, however again if the patient misses this window then the patient when those are the patients that you see now having uh, focal deficits now you know um, uh, permanent uh, motor sensory uh, deficits resulting from the stroke uh, because like I said if you if you, if you uh, look at the signs and symptoms we discussed earlier not all patients will have slurring of speech especially women the patients will just present with um, a headache for instance and then they had no idea that they're already suffering a stroke so that will lead to you know an under treatment uh, of the stroke other interventions besides the uh, intraarterial administration of the auto place is also uh, carotid artery <coughs> uh, angioplasty now with stenting if this meaning the patient um, has uh, the obstruction is in the uh, carotid artery not in the uh, cerebral artery so that's the procedure we can also do uh, endarterectomy which, which is uh, they'll open the carotid artery and um, you know surgically open it and uh, clean out the plaque so that's a common procedure also or just um, no um opening the carotid artery and putting in a stent take note that uh, these are the complications that can result uh, from that procedure so this is for um, angioplasty with uh, carotid st uh, stent placement and like I said if the stroke is hemorrhagic and these are your causes then of course the uh, procedure will be surgery okay. again they are discussed in chapter um, 36 okay and remember I said uh, last week that increased ICP will be written all over uh, chapter 45 here are your signs and symptoms again chart 45-6 these are uh, you already know these these were the uh, same things we discussed under uh, traumatic brain injury and here's the Cushing's triad and the abnormal positioning indicating brain herniation and these are your um, practices um, I know we didn't have this in uh, traumatic brain injury but here's your complete 
um, interventions. Okay, so very good. Select all apply question right there. And as I mentioned earlier, this is our goal. So throughout the stroke, we want to maintain uh, blood pressure of uh, between 140 and 150 systolic uh, in order to maintain uh, cerebral uh, perfusion pressure. Uh, the formula again, we already discussed extensively last week. Okay, so you should know the reason behind why we want our blood pressure high, not normal. I mean, sl slightly high. And here's another warning. Okay, so uh, they they sound redundant, but because um, it's 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 uh, it's important. Okay, so that's why they keep mentioning it, mentioning it again and again. Just most likely, you know, that that will also be on your <coughs> um, exam. All right. So please read the rest of the other complications. These are self-explanatory. Uh, of course, there will be um, because of either your administering octoplase or um, having under under your patient undergoing surgery to repair. Um, I mean to treat the hemorrhagic stroke so there are complications that will result the patient will have uh, neurologic deficits okay? uh, namely hydrocephalus re-bleeding etc and now let's go to um, discharge now so before the patient is discharged as I mentioned in the um, in the ambulance or at home patient will be given aspirin okay so this one is okay before out of place administration because we um, Okay, uh, in case you're wondering what happened, I just dropped my um, <laughs> computer, sorry. Okay, uh, let's continue. Um, so what was I saying? Um, okay, uh, what was I saying? Okay, so um, first aid um, in transit, the patient will be given a regular aspirin. Uh, however, after out the place administration, aspirin should not be given within 24 hours. Okay. Um, however, uh, after that, of course, after 24 hours, uh, the patient will be on aspirin or depending on the patient's risk factors, doctors will decide either uh, whether or not to put them on um, aspirin only or if they put them on Plavix only. Okay, here's uh, clopidogrel or Plavix. Or sometimes patients will be put on both. Um, they'll be on aspirin and uh, Plavix at the same time. <clears throat> Take note that the uh, anticoagulants here are uh, given only if the patient has uh, a reason for the anticoagulation, meaning um, let's say the in the case of uh, embolic stroke for instance, of course the you, you know on um, uh, table 45-1 that the cause there is usually cardiac so uh, one of them most common is uh, from atrial fibrillation so in that case then the patient must be on anticoagulation for that not because of the stroke okay that's not usually um, uh, treatment just because you had a stroke okay so that's right here so heparin and Warfarin are used in the presence of atrial fibrillation. Uh, I hope I made that clear. 
Of course, and other treatments here, please read on your own, such as uh, calcium, calcium channel blockers, for instance, and then the stool softeners. These are supportive interventions to prevent uh, ICP, increase ICP, um, de decrease the likelihood, I mean, control uh, hypertension. Okay, so to manage the um, risk factors for stroke. Because um, having one doesn't immunize the patient from another one. So they already had a stroke, so they are at risk for another one. The rest of these are related to safety, um, sensory motor uh, deficit management, such as the dysphagia, you know, the impaired swallowing that results, the um, return of uh, motor sensory function. Okay, so they will need extensive rehab for that. Take note that nutrition is a serious cause here because <clears throat> the patient is a uh, danger for dysphagia, so they may not be given the optimum nutrition as a result. So this will be a collaboration between the dietitian and the um, speech language pathologist okay, in, in maintaining the patient's nutrition. All right, I put this on the blueprint right here on the um, different types of aphasia. Ah, uh, right here, line 24. Okay, so here's your answer for that. Table 45-3. So you have expressive, receptive, or both. You'll have both. There's also a global aphasia. Please read them. Um, know what, what they mean, what the uh, patient's presentations will be for each one. And of course, these are your interventions. Okay. So that's how you manage aphasia. So it's um, how to communicate with a patient with uh, impaired uh, verbal communication. I mentioned earlier the unilateral inattention, so they are all here. So here is the intervention for those. Okay. Oh, um, I forgot about this part here. There's a question here on uh, psychosocial changes in stroke. Okay, I forgot to mention this part. It's um, under assessment. right here psychosocial okay it's not uncommon for these patients to experience emotional lability now take note that this is a physiologic uh, problem okay this is because of a, a loss of blood supply to the so there's damage here to the frontal lobe uh, which controls your emotions now this is not managed the same way as you do uh, a um, psych problem like like what you have in depression in because um, um, you can also have uh, emotional lability in um, in let's say bipolar disorder in schizophrenia for instance okay in uh, manic depressive disorders now this is not treated the same way because unlike psychiatric disorders wherein it, it you know you 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 treat it with therapy this one is not due to an underlying uh, conflict okay this is a, a, a an actual um, physiologic injury to the frontal lobe so the patients here cannot control these um, behaviors uh, or these emotions okay there's no reason uh, there's no psychological reason behind it Okay, so it's not treated with with drugs or with therapy. Okay, so um, it's important to know that the best you can do here is because this is now, um, I mean, there's no, you, you can't um, do therapeutic communication for this because even the patient doesn't know why they're doing it. Okay, this, um, so you, you can't treat it with uh, therapy. So the uh, best thing to approach it is to just uh, distract the patient or remove them from um, the environment 
to avoid embarrassing the patient or causing conflict to uh, the rest of the group who may not understand the patient's behavior. Okay. Okay, so again, please um, look at the uh, interventions here for your unilateral inattention. And I mentioned the core measures earlier. So here are your eight core measures. So each choke patient must receive these services. Okay, so every uh, ischemic stroke patient must receive VTE prophylaxis, must be discharged on antithrombic therapy. So we mentioned aspirin, Plavix. Um, anticoagulation if the patient has a fib and then of course thrombolytic therapy if indicated now the and then so on please read the rest uh, including this one the statin medication of course of course the uh, risk factor for um, stroke uh, for ischemic stroke is uh, atherosclerosis okay um, specifically for a thrombotic uh, stroke now for oh. okay for um the rest of these please look at your blueprint um you can ask me questions through text or email uh, or just drop by the office if you can see me during the week Okay, um, and that's it. Oh, the rest of the chapter here are, are again on uh, rehab, and here are your teaching for the pet family. Of course, these are the, uh, you know, the teaching we do for. You see signs about that um, all over, but as nurses, we of course are not uh, limited to this. We have. Uh, the entire chart 45-1 for that okay